we're going to be talking about today is the origin of Monterey Bay and its habitat. And this is a tale of wind, water, and stone. And actually, I could have had included fire in that because that does play into this picture. So first question is, why the bay? Why is there this particular bay on this stretch of coast? And uh, then after that, the next thing we're going to do is look at the various habitats that exist in the bay and how they developed what controls their character. This is going to involve forces within the earth. It's going to involve the motion of the ocean and waves, tides, wind, all play a role in certain of the habitats. And climatic perturbations also are going to rear their head. So we're going to start with why is there a bay at this particular location? It's a unique, large coastal indentation on the U.S. West Coast. Nothing really quite like it. And the story is really a story of waves versus rocks. And you can see some of that story here. This is a photograph of Stillwell Hall at Fort Ord. And there has been clearly an erosion problem, and there are protective measures taken by putting a lot of riprap out. And this looks like it's fairly successful because four years later, 2002, the riprap is still there, and uh, so is still well hauled, though there has been some erosion. But just two years later, in 2004, this is what it looked like the riprap is gone, Stillwell Hall is gone, and the cliffs are more eroded. And the reason they erode so fast here and throughout most of the bay is because the sea cliffs are not made of particularly durable material. This is a sandstone. I call it young. You could probably take a piece of it and crumble it in your hand, although if you took a piece and threw it and hit somebody in the head, they would know it wasn't just loose sand. And that's a penny for scale if you uh, can see the penny. The reason the bay is here, I think, is because the shores are so easily eroded. And why are they so easily eroded? Well, we have big waves here on the West Coast, and that's part of the story. And plate tectonics is another part of this particular story. And Presently, what we have, we're living on a slab that's caught between two giant plates. The Pacific plate goes all the way from California across to New Zealand, and the Atlantic plate on the other side goes all the way across North America and halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. Two monstrous chunks of the Earth's crust moving against one another. Pacific plate moving to the north several inches a year, the North American plate coming across at about an inch a year from the east. And this is active today. These faults are still moving. This is an active boundary between these plates. This is, as of this morning, the earthquakes of the last week. And you can see we've got quite a few of them within this area, including one out here in Monterey Bay, which is brand new. I had not seen that one before. It's tiny. You wouldn't have felt it, but it just shows that, yep, these, these faults do actively move. So if you have a tablecloth and you put one hand on one side, and one hand on the other, and you move one away and one toward you, what do you get? Well, you're going to get wrinkles. And that's what you get in the process of these giant plates rubbing against one another. But the wrinkles are huge. There are things like Santa Cruz Mountain. And what we'll talk about next week is the Santa Lucia Range. And the low spots are the essentially the, the sags in the wrinkles. So that some areas are going up, form uplands, but other areas are going down. And over the last few hundred thousand years, this is what we've seen, down warp in the area of the bay and uplift on either side. You can see this rather clearly if you look at the coast north of Santa Cruz, these flat benches that are marked by the arrows are positions of the sea. The highest one is the oldest one, and they get progressively younger as you approach the sea. Same thing on the south side. 
You'll see more of this next week. But at Point Lobos, you can see three distinct terraces, each marking a position. You'll see it hasn't gone up quite as much as the north side, but it is rising on the south. So for the last few hundred thousand years, the area of which Monterey Bay occupies has been warping down. And this makes a real difference because if the rocks are all the same resistance and they just go across flat, the result is as the waves attack them, you're going to get a relatively straight coastline. But if the coastline is buckled, so the younger deposits are moved down, the waves will erode those younger, less resistant strata, and the result is an embayed coast. And I think that's what we have here in Monterey Bay, is that it forms because of these younger sandstones. On the southern side, we have very resistant granodiorite that I'll talk about later, forming the Monterey Peninsula and backed by the Monterey Shale. I'll talk about it as well, which also occurs on the north side of the bay, a fairly resistant rock. And we also have a submarine canyon that comes up right smack in the middle. And this raises a question, did the canyon create the bay or the bay create the canyon? And uh, what I notice here, let me back up one. What I notice is that the upper reaches of the canyon are incised into the shelf, very much like the ones over to the, just to the north, we have these large gullies or small canyons, whichever you want to call them, that are incised into the shelf. And they're about the same size as Monterey Canyon up in its upper reaches. But Monterey Canyon comes down and joins a huge valley. Valley lies on the opposite side. It heads up right against a fairly substantial fault, one that we'll, we'll talk about in more detail next week. But I think the bay created the canyon in the upper part. And by happenstance, it just today connects with a much larger old fossil or relic canyon. I don't really believe in coincidences that much, but in this case, that's surely what it looks like. And with time, the two will be separated and that big canyon will continue to move to the north relative to the rocks on the side that head up in the bay. So that's what I think is going on. We've got two separate canyons that just happen to be aligned right now. It's kind of bizarre, but that's the way it looks. So Monterey Bay then is a product of geology and wave erosion. And the erosion is pretty severe. The stretch that you see here in the, the uh, right-hand side going from Monterey up to Elkhorn Slough, which is sort of that bit of an indentation in the coast right here. The state of California estimates that this is the most rapidly eroding piece of, of um, coast in California today. And it, the bay has a remarkable array of biological habitats. I tried to find a really good definition for habitat, and I didn't find one that really sort of fit with what I thought, so I combined several of them. And this is my definition, which is an ecological tract, meaning an area with characteristic non-living components, processes, and other aspects of that habitat, which supports a specific community of living species. So that's the definition we're gonna use for a habitat. Habitats in Monterey Bay are quite a few. Uh, there are shelf habitats, outer shelf, middle shelf, inner shelf. There are coastal habitats or shoreline habitats, the sandy near shore, the sandy beach, the tidal wetlands, coastal dunes, and down on the Monterey Peninsula, rocky shores. And there are other habitats as well particularly around the Monterey Peninsula, the deep reef, the kelp forest, the shale reef, and the submarine canyon floor, which once I dug into it, I found there really wasn't enough information available 
to talk very much about that as a, as a habitat. So I'm gonna leave that one out at the end. So the four things I think that are important in defining a habitat are the substrate, what the seafloor or the bottom, the soil looks like beneath your feet or the seafloor. The amount of subaerial exposure <clears throat> can be really important in certain habitats, fluid motion and light level. And I think those four things are the really major determining factors in the nature in the development and the nature of a, of a habitat. So we're gonna start with the shelf habitats. And there are three, the outer shelf, middle shelf, and inner shelf. And the primary factors for the shelf habitats are really only two. What's on the bottom, the substrate, and what happens to it in terms of fluid movement as the water above it moves in one direction or another. The shelf goes out to about 500 feet, which is 10 miles offshore. And then at a water depth of around 600 feet, it rolls over and goes down a very steep slope into the, the abyss. So we're going to start with the shelf. And our shelf is something, these are common all around the world. And they're caused by glaciation, continental glacier, really large scale, massive amounts of ice that are formed from water that is derived from the ocean. And so sea level fluctuates up and down significantly as these ice sheets form and melt. So during the, during the glacial stage, the ice sheets are forming and sea level is low. And then as that ice melts, and we go back to normal temperatures or what we consider normal today, then sea level comes back up. That's in excess of 100 meters. So there are shelves all around the world. Uh, some of them really broad, like the Atlantic Shelf, uh, 100 miles across. Monterey Bay, the shelf is only about 10 miles wide, much shorter, but it's still present, still a distinct feature, and it has its own set of habitats. So most of this area, but not all of it, is covered with sand and mud. This is a diagram that was made by one of my colleagues at the US Geological Survey. And you can see rocks appear on the shoreline, Monterey Peninsula up near Santa Cruz, they have rocks, but there are also rocks out on the very edge of the continental shelf. And this is one of the primary data sources. It's a, an app that is put out by a fishing group. And uh, it not only delineates the bottom contours in great detail, but it also shows the bottom type. And I was really interested to see where this data came from to see whether they were reliable. And the only thing they say is the original source for all data for the United States is the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. So I presume the data are good. They seem to be consistent with what I know. And so we can look at the shelf and look at the substrate as reflected in these maps. And then notice there's variation across there. Some areas are sand, some areas are mud. And the sandy areas in the north side of the bay are all concentrated inside the 120 foot bathymetric contour. And on the other side of that, you get mud. And so you can divide this then, that can be the basis for defining the inner shelf underlain by sand and a middle shelf underlain by mud. On the south side of the bay, it's not quite as clear cut, but I think the pattern still remains on the south part of Monterey Bay. So we have then this pattern of sand on the inner shelf and then mud on the middle shelf. And we'll talk about the outer shelf in, in just a bit. And one of the things we need to look at is sand grain sizes. And sand ranges anywhere from basically a millimeter across to a sixteenth of a millimeter. And below that is silt and clay. <clears throat> 
And the part we're talking about here really is in sort of the medium sand down to the clay size material. Um, geologists have an interesting way of telling the difference between silt and clay. That is, you chew on it. If it's gritty, it's silt. If it's not gritty, it's clay. We're very technologically advanced. So we've got then these three boundaries or these three shelf types, inner, middle, and outer, uh, each with its own characteristic and each with its, its own uh, seafloor type. And this is um, just looking again at the uh, trend as we go from shallow to deep, we go from fine sand or even medium sand into the silt and clay as we get into deeper water. This is borne out by this diagram that shows this transition from sand in the shallow water to coarse silt and mud in the deeper water. So why is this? Why do we have this, this pattern of changes going across? Well, waves are a big factor and they're essentially a rhythmic disturbance that's transmitted along the interface between the air and the water. And the waves that we get here are generated by the wind. Distant storms generate waves that travel to the coast. And it creates a, a big storm, a sizable disturbance in the sea surface. And the rounded waves that form, called swell, propagate away from this into areas that are undisturbed. And they just keep moving. They don't lose any energy at all as they pass across the surface of the ocean. <clears throat> Long period waves go faster than short period waves, so they sort themselves out. So typically what you get is a, from an individual storm, you'll get waves of just one period, but it may change through time. And the long period waves are faster than the short period waves. So an 18 second wave can move a lot more rapidly than a 10 second wave. So that they segregate themselves by their size. And um, they're just this moving distortion of the water surface that is generated by a distant storm. But their effect goes down below the surface. The non-breaking waves don't transport any water with them. Instead, it just moves in a circle as the wave passes. And in the water below, underneath the waves, they all, that water also moves in a circle, but the circle gets smaller and smaller. And at some time, at some distance below the surface, the depth will diminish such that there's no motion at all. This is called wave base. It's equal to half of the wavelength of the waves that are producing them at the surface. And when we get into shallow water, this circular motion becomes elliptical. And this, this is going to be an important factor when we start talking about the sandy near shore. This is a diagram that shows a settling velocity of different grain sizes. In other words, how fast they fall through still water. So of course, sand will drop about 15 centimeters a second, which is pretty fast. But you get down to very fine sand, and it is moving at less than a centimeter down to about three millimeters. So it's still settling, but it's settling more slowly. But when we get into the coarse silt range and into the mud range, the settling velocities are much, much slower. So what this means is that if sand and mud are thrown into suspension, the sand settles out quickly, but the mud will remain in the water for a longer period of time. And so we have this motion of the waves of, as they pass, we get this elliptical motion and back and forth motion along the seafloor. So what's happening is as the waves come in, they're disturbing the bottom, throwing the sand up in suspension. But the sand grains settle back down pretty quickly, but mud stays up in the water column. So it drifts around within the bay. And as it drifts offshore, it settles out. And then it takes a much bigger wave to put it back into suspension. And in the meantime, any mud in the sandy um, part of the bay, the shallow water part, gets thrown up into suspension. It's going to last a while. It may settle back down there, but it also may drift out and get into deeper water. And once it gets there, 
it tends to stay. So we have this pattern of going from shallow water sands to deeper water muds. But then we go back to sand again as we get to the outer shelf. In fact, there's even sand and gravel on the shelf edge outboard of Monterey. And so this is our outer shelf habitat. And so we have this trend in Monterey Bay from sand to sandy mud to mud, and then back to sand, mud, gravel, rocks on the outer part. So what's causing that? Well, it's related to the Pleistocene sea level changes that we talked about earlier. It's estimated that during the last glacial low stand at the maximum, the shoreline stood well offshore through much of California and much of Monterey Bay. Probably this much of the bay was exposed about 20,000 years ago. You could walk around out there with plants growing, probably trees, maybe sand dunes. And then you had the shoreline. And so that then accounts for these sandy deposits as we get out of the outer part of the bay. They're left over from the Pleistocene Ice Age and haven't been covered yet with the mud. So it's kind of like this with a bit of Pleistocene sediment sitting out there on the shelf and covered by the modern sediment that eventually will creep out as more is added and cover over the top of it. So the general transitions then in the bay are at around 150 feet is where we sort of see this transition from sand to mud. And so in the inner shelf, we get rippled sands marking the seafloor. And the middle shelf going further out, we get mud. And these support two very different kinds of, of communities. And you can see this even within the inner shelf sand habitat, where Mbari has shown that there's systematic uh, variation and in the water depths of about 50 to 100 feet in the outer part, you've got muddy fine sand, but it's still sandy. And it doesn't move very often because of the water depth. It takes big waves to do it. So you get things like burrowing uh, tuba numbers and uh, uh, sea pens, brittle stars. As you get in closer, 15 to 50 feet, you've got pretty much fine sand, which moves a lot. So you get a totally different set of animals that are living in this sandy environment of the inner shelf. So actually the continental shelf is a large complex area. And the primary factors controlling it, as I said, were substrate, what the seafloor is like, and the fluid motion, the waves and the currents that pass across that bottom. Now we're going to move into shallow water and back out of the water as we go to the shoreline habitats. Sandy near shore, sandy beach, tidal wetlands, coastal dunes, and ultimately to the rocky shores. So we're going to start with the sandy near shore. And sandy near shore is the zone of really the breaking waves, where shoaling waves meet the beach. So everything that's dry here is, is part of the beach and everything is wet. It's part of this sandy nearshore habitat. And the primary factors, again, are the substrate. What is the size of the sediment on the floor and the fluid motion of the waves that cross across the top of it. And it's an area where the waves really change their shape. They go breaking, they pass through the surf before they end up a swash and backwash on a beach. So the sandy near shore are defined as big, where the waves begin shoaling up to the front edge of the beach, the seaward edge of the beach. And because the waves are changing sort of all the time, then the dimensions of the sandy near shore change with that. So it's a very dynamic event or area. So what is wave shoaling? Waves, as they enter the shallow water near the shoreline, change their character. So the rounded waves that you had offshore start to become peaks, and the wave height starts to build. 
we get long period swell coming in and it's just gently rounded waves. But as those waves approach the shoreline, they start to steepen up and you see this pattern of becoming peaked. So what happens is these rounded deep water waves come in and as they become peaked, there's a little bit of motion of the water in a shore direction. It's not very much, but there is a little bit of motion. But what really happens is because you have the wave crest, the high points of the waves being fairly narrow peaks separated by these broad flat troughs of the waves, you move the same amount of water forward under the crest of the wave as you do under the moving seaward under the trough, but there's less time for it. And because there's less time, the um, velocity of the water moving forward under the peak of the wave is stronger than the velocity of the, under the trough of the wave that moves seaward. You can really feel this when you're diving. And uh, there's no net transport of water, it's just a change in the velocities. There's, there's less time for the water to move forward under the crest than there is under the trough. So landward floor, landward flow under that crest is faster than the seaward flow back out to sea under the trough. And you can really feel this when you're out there diving. You spend a lot of time diving in the Southern Oregon surf zone and uh, you, you learn to utilize this, this pattern of um, abrupt movement shoreward and long drawn out movements seaward. And there's no real transport of water that occurs with this, but the amount of sand that gets moved responds very much to the velocity. So a change in velocity will make the sand move to a much greater extent. Then there's one last change in a wave as it approaches the shoreline. And that is that it breaks. Basically, typically when it gets to the water depth about 1.3 of the wave height, at that point, the waves will break. And breakers do transport water. They carry water with them as they approach the coast. And um, if you've got a gentle gradient, the breaker zone is really wide. If it's steep, the breaker zone is much narrower. But in Monterey Bay, that breaker zone is usually pretty wide. This is the bay. And they do transport water. They move water in, and that water piles up and has to go somewhere. And one of the ways it goes is along shore, depending on the angle which the waves are coming in. So you get longshore currents, and some of these are really fast. I've been down at a, on a beach in off southern Oregon on a day that the waves weren't particularly re remarkable, but the velocities alongshore were so fast you couldn't possibly maintain your position against them. And so the offshore up to now, the shelf has been kind of a featureless plain, but we get into the sandy nearshore and it no longer is necessarily featureless because we get bars. And you can see a bar out here and then a deeper water trough behind that bar, all part of the inner part of the, uh, the nearshore zone. Sometimes the bars are attached to the shore and oblique, like this set in Oregon, and they can be huge. This is Southern Oregon, but you can see the trough, there's longshore, probably very strong longshore flow and sh shown by the arrow. And then I'm guessing a really monstrous rip current running way out to sea in that trough where the waves are not breaking. So essentially what this is doing is producing rivers in the near shore that move the sand and some of it moves longshore, but you do get these rip currents where the longshore currents merge and then the water flows out to, into deeper water in the form of a rip. And small waves produce small currents, but big waves produce some very large rip currents. Uh, you cannot swim against them. 
And uh, this is where people out there getting caught in the rip current get in trouble because if they swam sideways parallel to the shoreline, they'd reach water which wasn't moving seaward, and then they could get themselves right back across the longshore currents that are present near the shoreline, and they're back on the beach. This is up by Sand City, and the breaking waves break when they get to a certain water depth. And the fact that we've got here a gap between the breaking waves means the water is deeper. So you can walk along the, the beaches of, of uh, Monterey Bay and watch the breaking waves and you see, see gaps that persist, you're almost certain to be looking at a rip current channel going out to sea. This, as far as I know, is the only photograph ever taken in an active rip channel. This is Southern Oregon. And uh, the velocities are so great that you can't possibly swim against them. It's all you can do to hold your position uh, I remember having a couple giant spikes driven into the sand trying to hold position in a rip channel and just being dragged by the waves. It's a really powerful currents. So it's a very dynamic environment out in the sandy near shore. And one is you, you can learn a lot by just looking at the pattern of the waves. You can see a lot in Monterey Bay. And there is, it does form a habitat, as unlikely as that might seem given the activity out there. But uh, just seaward of the breaker zone and near the south end of Monterey Bay, we made a dive some years ago and found out there was a the sea floor was just blanketed with sand dollars. And the sand dollars were all lined up and they were shingled in such a way that as the onshore surge came, they were dipping down away from it, so they were stable. I've seen olive snails out there, and if they get washed out, what I saw was they would spread their mantle out, and they would sort of fly through the water, and then they would come down, settle out, and burrow back in. So they survive out in this very dynamic zone as well, burrowing into the upper part of the sand. Now. We were talking about the waves moving water and the fact that the water landward flow under the crest of the wave over here was faster than the seaward flow in the opposite direction. And this has a big impact on the transport of sand along the bottom because it responds to the velocity of the water over it um, in a big way. So sand is carried by the waves up the beach, up the a shore face, and uh, the part of the near shore that's off the beach gets carried up, and that deposits sand on the beach foreshore. So that sand comes from the sea. It's pushed up by the shoaling waves. That's just what shoaling waves do. So that takes us to our next habitat, the sandy beach. And the sandy beach is determined by substrate, fluid movement, and subaerial exposure becomes really important here. The movement of water on the beach is mostly by the swash and backwash of the waves. And as swash comes in, moving the water in, backwash is when the water moves back down toward the beach. So sand gets moved up the beach during the swash and carried back down the beach during the backwash. And if the amounts are similar, then the beach stays constant. The beach profile stays constant. There's no addition, no subtraction. And uh, so you get an equilibrium beach profile. But often one of these dominates over the other, and the beach is either building out or it's eroding. Layering of the sand is essentially defined by sheet flow. And all of these the lower part of these cores, these are x-rays of, of box cores, you see the, that very planar lamination, that's reflecting the swash and backwash of the waves. So the rim, ripply stuff up on top is where a small stream crossed the beach. And minerals, certain kinds of minerals really get concentrated on the back edge of the beach. These are the 
heavy minerals, they're heavier in weight, and they're also smaller. And so they're, they're concentrated by the swash and backwash on the back surfaces of the beach. So the sand in the beach foreshore comes to the sea, it's pushed up by shoaling waves. So that's how it gets there. What causes it to leave? Well, breaking waves carry water toward the shore and the water piles up and actually raises water level just a bit. And that means there's a sloping surface and the water runs to run back to the sea, which is what water wants to do. It always wants to move downhill. And so large waves induce the greatest amount of setup where the wave water level uh, increases in the set down, which is just outside the breaker zone, where sea level is just a bit lower. So you got a sloping surface in the sea level right close to the beach, which means that during a storm with big waves, the sand is carried offshore and deposited. Then after the storm, the sand is moved by the waves back up and the beach rebuilds. So we have summer profiles where the sand builds up, and winter profiles when you have storms, and if you have a really big storm, it can strip the sand off the beach altogether. You can see this, this is Carmel Beach after a winter storm, and see how much of it's exposed. And then during the summertime, that sand all comes back. So there's a massive amount of movement of sand from offshore to onshore and back again, depending upon what the waves are doing. And so you get a lot of, this is when the beach erosion occurs, when you have these periods of large waves coming in, stripping the sand off the beach, directly attaching the, attacking the shoreline. So you might expect with all that going on, the beaches to be a biologically barren environment. But there are things like razor clams that live there. Razor clams are delicious, but they also live in the lower parts of the beach where they survive by digging. And they dig fairly fast. Some people say faster than a human can dig. Well, that's not really true, but they extend out their siphon, they expand and collapse their, their valves. And in doing so, they find a way to move down. And they can move into, uh, move downward at a rate of, um, oh, probably several inches, um, maybe in, in, in 20 or 30 seconds, they might be able to move an inch. But I can dig a lot faster than that. There are also sand crabs on the beach. These are, you see these all over Monterey Bay. These are fun little guys that are designed for the beach and they can only move backwards. So they burrow into the sand. And as a wave comes by, if they need to go shoreward, They'll jump up, catch the wave and surf in and move up the beach. And then as the tide falls, they'll jump up and catch a wave and ride it back down the beach. So they're, they're a little surface on the beach, but they're all over the beaches in the bay. As are little amphipod sand fleas, uh, beach hoppers that you'll see hopping around, uh, especially where you've got some, some seaweed that's washed up on shore. And a lot of things live within that sand. There are pelicate worms, sandworms that swim through the sand, um, blood worms that can occur in such numbers that when you dig into the beach, it actually turns red. So there's just a whole bunch of animals that live within the sand of the beach. And uh, these, are, these are blood worms. You can see all the holes that they have created as they move around. But I think one of the most interesting of the animal group on the beach are called myophyta. And these are tiny little things that live between the sand grains. And there are lots of them. And they represent most of the major phyla, the major building blocks of life. It's a whole separate world down there living between the sand grains, perpetually dark, um, being disturbed by the waves, um, drying out. These are, this is, this is just remarkable, but there is, and we don't really appreciate this, but there is a whole world of tiny little animals 
that live in the sand below our feet. And we get transients passing through both fish and birds. So the sandy near shore, although it looks may look like a barren desert, it's, it's far from it. Beaches might be a threatened habitat in some places because uh, there's a lot of erosion going on and loss of sand uh, during storm action. As a storm action increases through global warming, this is going to be a bigger problem. I don't know that it's going to be a serious problem for Monterey Bay, but there it's eroding so fast right now that I wouldn't want to make it any worse. So the wind blows sand up into the dunes, and that takes us to our next habitat, the coastal dune habitat. This is a sandy habitat. Uh, the substrate's important. The fluid motion is vital, wind, and it's all severely exposed. So the onshore wind blows off the coast and carries the beach sand up. And then as the winds lose energy, that sand gets piled up in a four dune ridge. And the sand moves up the slope and then slides down the back face. So one face is gentle facing the sea, but the face that is landward is steeper. And typically you'll see a whole set of these forming with the four dune ridge passing, new dunes uh, forming, and uh, four dunes becoming eventually inactive and left behind. What lives out there, not a whole lot, but there is a place for many of the, the coastal birds and particularly the snowy plovers who live on the sand dunes of Monterey Bay. You can see on, if this is Pacific Grove, the lighthouse is right there. And you can see these ridges. These are old fossil dune ridges. So dunes were really important during previous times, probably more important than they are today. But one of the most important things that dunes do is they protect behind them a wetland. And the wetland is an amazing environment. Uh, I spent a number of years in the 1970s studying the largest embayment on the Pacific, second largest embayment on the Pacific coast, or um, estuary. And that is Willowball Bay in Washington. And here, everything's important. The light level, the substrate, the fluid movement, and the amount of subaerial exposure all play into what can live, thrive in the bay. And they're, they're really remarkable because if you look in this photo out to see the violence of the waves out there, and yet inside the wetlands, it's tranquil. It's a place, it's a nursery, it's a, a beautiful place. And I could probably spend the whole hour just talking about it. Eelgrass beds, really important um, in terms of providing shelter for little fish. It's a nursery that occurs in here. Sea otters have discovered this in this century, moved back into Elkhorn Slough and have actually caused the eelgrass to thrive because there is a little um, sea hare that cleans the algae that grows on the seagrass off. Otherwise, the algae grows, blocks the light, and the seagrass doesn't uh, do particularly well. Well, there are crabs that eat those little um, sea slugs. And when the otters came in, they ate the crabs, which meant that there were lots of sea slugs, which meant that the seagrass got much cleaned up, and so the return of the otters really improves the whole quality of Elkhorn Slough. Then we're going to move some habitats down on the peninsula, and there are four we're going to talk about there, the Deep Reef, the Rocky Shore, the Kelp Forest, and a Shell Reef. And um, common to all of these are is a firm rocky substrate. And most of that substrate is formed by a rock called granodiorite, although in the shell reef we get another type of rock that I'll talk about in a bit. But the foundation of this whole area is a rock called granodiorite, 
It is an igneous rock that formed deep beneath the earth, had a fiery origin. It was originally a melt and crystals formed from that melt. Eventually the whole thing cooled. And um, it's a consequence of plate tectonics because when plates run into each other, when an oceanic plate runs into a continental plate, the heavier oceanic plate sinks down beneath it in a process geologists call subduction. And uh, water that gets carried down into that zone, eventually the pressure is so great, it gets squeezed out into the rocks on the side. And those rocks, very hot, uh, when water hits them, it decreases the uh, atomic bonds between the material and it melts. And so you get a melt, melted magma, which when it cools, becomes a granodiorite or a granitic rock. And all of that happened back during the time of the dinosaurs, about 75 to 120 million years ago. So how did it get here? This, this happened when a big plate called the Farallon Plate was colliding with North America. But this was miles below the surface and how do we get that up to the Monterey Peninsula? Well, the way we get it is the move, movement of the plates again, because on the outboard side of the Fairlawn plate was a Pacific plate, and it was moving to the north, northeast. And eventually, somewhere between 35 and 25 million years ago, it collided with the North American continent. It broke off a huge chunk, including the granodiorite, and attached it to the Pacific plate and moved it up to its present location on the Monterey Peninsula. And this underpins the rocky shore of the deep reef and the kelp forest. And uh, the rocky shore is important. All of these factors are important. Um, Beautiful examples of it at, uh, all around the peninsula, particularly the northern part of Pacific Grove. And it, it's beset by huge waves. This is one of the big factors of the storm waves. And these are likely to get worse as the ocean warms. So that's the rocky shoreline. Then as you go into deep water, you have sort of that, those same rocks exposed at the surface, but they're at depths where the waves are no longer affected. So this, the deep reef habitat has the, is it controlled by a substrate, it needs a rocky substrate, but the fluid motion is very much reduced. And, uh, but it still is probably influenced by waves. Uh, we noted that the circular motion induced by a passing wave diminishes at depth until you get down to about half the wavelength, which is where the motion stops. But if you look at waves in the range of 10 seconds, eight to 12 seconds, all of these, their wave base lies down at depths around 100 meters or, or deeper. So they will stir the bottom, not very much, but enough to bring food to the organisms that live down on those rocks. Then as you get into shallower water, about 20 to 80 feet, you may have a kelp forest. Um, the aquarium has done a marvelous job of showing and creating interest in the kelp forest. But this is a habitat that um, is really remarkable. Um, what determines it are the substrate. It has to have a firm substrate it, uh, to climb onto so it doesn't get washed away. It has to have a uh, motion to keep the nutrients moving and uh, sustaining the kelp, and it has to have an appropriate light level for photosynthesis. So you go then, you can see here the rocky shore, close to the shoreline, the kelp forest, just a bit offshore, and then out in deeper water, we have the deep reef, just all sort of continuums of the same processes or the same environment, but producing different kinds of habitat. Then there's the shale reef. And the shale reef is a habitat that lies in the coastal waters 
um, and it's controlled by the substrate, very important. Fluid motion needs fluid motion, probably light level because there are so fair amount of algae that grows on the shale reef. Um, this is a picture of the, uh, I believe the deep reef and the shale reef is over here. It occupies a fairly substantial place offshore, just, just off Monterey Harbor. And it looks very different from that deep reef. And you can see there are lots of holes in this rock. Uh, this is another picture of the, taken just very recently of the shell reef. Lots of animals live on this thing. It's composed of a rock that is exposed in road cuts all around Monterey. It's a light colored tan rock. It is a soft rock. This is a fossil crab, it does contain fossils. And uh, if you took a nail and scratched it across the granite diorite, all you do is dull the nail. But if you took that same nail and scratched across the uh, Monterey shell, it would leave an indentation. You'd scratch it. And the rock is soft. And because it's soft, then not really less, let's say, less durable, it gets burrowed by clams and other organisms that actually create their holes inside the rock. I don't know how they do it, but they, but they definitely do. Back about 12 million years ago, down in Southern California, there was an embayment. And in that embayment, there were lots of little diatoms living and depositing mud on the seafloor. Diatoms are microscopic plants that have shells or tests of silica. And uh, when they die, they settle to the seafloor, forming a mud that's mostly made up of their remains, as, as pieces of, of glass, basically. And with time, this breaks down and starts to form a rock. And that rock is the Monterey Shale. It's also the Carmel Stone, which you see in many of the buildings around here, is a particularly hard part of the Monterey Formation. So the Monterey Shale crops out onshore. It's a very important rock in this area. In fact, derives this name, of course, from Monterey. So those are the, the offshore habitats. I had originally thought about talking about the uh, submarine canyon, but got into it, I found so little information that it wasn't uh, really, there, there's not enough to tell you about what goes on there. There is a, a community of tiny little organisms. Not, they're bigger than the Maya fauna of the beach, but a whole bunch of them live in the sand. But that bottom gets stirred up out there um, pretty commonly by massive underwater storms. So that's the shale reef. And um, those are Monterey Bay habitats. And that brings us to the close.